In this video, we're going to talk about how to name ionic compounds. Uh, so the most straightforward cases are pretty simple. We're going to start with the name of the cation, and then we're going to name the anion second and change its uh, ending of the name, its uh, suffix. So uh, in general, that means we must know the chemical formula for it. So let's say we were starting with something like magnesium fluoride, actually. If we're starting with magnesium fluoride, then what we need to first do is identify which is my cation and which is my anion. And uh, when we write out chemical formulas, we always write the cation first. So it's typically the metal. Um, and so here would be magnesium. And that would make fluorine my anion. All right, so once I have that, then I can actually name the compound, um, especially uh, because this will fit one of our simplest examples. We'll show you a few exceptions in a minute. So for naming the first half of the, the compound, the magnesium, I'm just going to name that the actual element name. And I can read this off of my periodic table. So I'll take that Mg, I'll convert it into its actual full name, magnesium, and I'll write that out. Next, I have the fluorine. It's the anion. I'm gonna um, name this based on its actual name from the periodic table, which would be fluorine. I'll write this out. And so that's what I would read on the periodic table. And I'm gonna take that I-N-E ending right here, and I'm actually gonna replace it um, to communicate that this isn't uh, an element, it's an anion. I'm gonna replace it with an I-D-E ending. And so all of my anions, when I name the full compound, will have that I-D-E ending, and that will indicate to my readers that they're, I'm talking about an inorganic, or sorry, an ionic compound. And so that fluorine becomes fluoride. Um, and I'll write those next to each other as two separate words. And that's my name for my ionic compound. I don't have to include the number of fluorine atoms. I don't need to include the charge on either of these ions because they are both ions that only form one particular charge. They don't have multiple oxidation states. And so that means that I can, just by knowing my elements, figure out what the ionic compound would be that they would form to form a neutral compound. And so I don't have to add in all that extra information because I, I can figure it out if I have a periodic table. Now, if I have something that I can't figure out um, just by having a periodic table on hand, then I'm gonna have to add a little bit more information into my name. And a perfect example of that is with transition metals. Uh, so we name a, a salt or a ionic compound that has a transition metal in it the same way we would a regular one, except we give a little bit more information. We tell the reader what the charge on the transition metal is. You almost said metalloenzyme. Uh, so we tell them what the charge on the transition metal actually is. So let's look at an example. We've got iron and chlorine. Um, so the first thing I do is I identify my cation and I identify my anion. Great. Iron will be my cation. I'll name it first. I go to my periodic table and I can just name it iron. There we go. Oops. Um, but in this case, that iron could have lots of possible charges, most commonly plus two or plus three, but I need to tell my reader which one it is because they won't know the number of chlorines like I do reading my chemical formula right here. So I need to give them some information about how many chlorines to expect in the compound or what the charge on that iron is. And so for these types of compounds, we always go with the charge on the metal. So I need to then take this information in my, my chemical formula and translate it into charges for my, my two ions. And so if I have uh, one iron and two chlorine, chlorine is always a negative one charge because it's in that seventh column of the periodic table, the seventh group, the halogens. So that means that if I have uh, two of these, I have an overall charge of negative two. And that now needs to be balanced out by just one iron because I have 
no subscript after the iron indicating more than one. So that means that iron has to be a plus two charge in order to actually balance out that negative two charge. So I know my iron is a plus two. So I'm gonna tell my reader it's a plus two by writing that charge in Roman numerals in parentheses. So it's really key here. Sorry, let me get a highlighter. Is that I'm using Roman numerals and I'm using parentheses. And it follows the cation. Now after that, I'm gonna go back to my normal naming convention. I'm gonna take the anion. I'm gonna write its name out as it appears on the periodic table and replace the ending with IDE. And for things like chlorine and fluorine that have that I-N-E ending, it's really easy to just replace I-N-E with I-D-E, right? A few of our nonmetals that'll be common anions are a little bit trickier like oxygen. It doesn't have that nice I-N-E that mirrors I-D-E. Um, so it's gonna be oxide. And so here you're actually getting rid of the Y-G-E-N. I mean, you can always refer to a table while you get used to this um, as seen in the previous slide. All right, here is another exception to our common naming rules. Um, and it is polyatomic ions. This is uh, something we see a lot, especially in biology. Um, but many ionic compounds are not just a single atom. They're instead a covalent molecule that has uh, electrons shared between the atoms. But the molecule itself has a charge associated with it. And it can be positive or negative. Most of them are negative. Um, and we call these polyatomic ions, that there's more than one atom that makes up this ion. And this polyatomic ion, those covalent bonds, won't break or change. Um, instead, we just have to treat it as one unit, especially for naming. And so let's take a look at an example. We have sodium bicarbonate, and we'll work backwards on this one. So first, I'm going to identify my cation and anion. And because sodium is written first, and there's no change to the the ending of the name, it matches my periodic table perfectly. That's my cation. So that makes everything that's following here my anion. But bicarbonate is not something that's on, it's not one of my elements, right? It's not, um, and it doesn't have an IDE ending, right? So note that ending is eight instead of IDE. So You'll have this polyatomic ion chart while you get used to these. Um, and so if when I look for bicarbonate right here, it's also called hydrogen carbonate. Here is my ion, it's HCO3 minus. So that means what I'm, I'm really combining here is a, a sodium ion and a bicarbonate ion. Now uh, there have, same but opposite charges. Sodium is a plus one charge and bicarbonate is a negative one. Uh, I don't have the tools yet at this level of intro chemistry to take the chemical formula without the charge and determine that charge from sodium bicarbonate. So it's going to require relying on a table that tells you the charges and names for um, polyatomic ions like this one here. And we'll go into some of the naming conventions here for some of these in a little bit but only for some of the classifications. So treat this bicarbonate the same as like a fluoride. It's the anion, you name it second. In this case, you just use the name that's in the table and it'll commonly have an A-T-E ending, an I-T-E ending, or I-U-M, things like that. We have a few with I-D-E's that you can see, cyanide and peroxide. So it takes a little bit of familiarity with these to to recognize that you're not searching for something on the periodic table for a while. Um, so that takes just a little bit of practice.